Welcome to episode 27 of the Hunt Backcountry podcast, presented by Exo Mountain Gear. In this episode, we speak with Clay Hayes. Going all the way back to episode 17, when we spoke with Land Tawny of the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, Land mentioned Clay in passing, and we were really intrigued by what Land had to say about Clay. You see, Clay has helped Land Tawny and the guys at Backcountry Hunters and Anglers develop the Backcountry College which is a series of online videos to educate hunters and anyone who wants to enjoy the backcountry. When we got to looking at it, we really enjoyed what Clay had to bring in terms of skills. Uh, Things like navigation, water procurement, fire starting. So the non-hunting but essential backcountry sort of survival type skills. As it turns out, Clay's a phenomenal hunter as well and really enjoys the traditional side of things. So we talk about those woodmanship skills, we talk about traditional archery, and even some of Clay's other video projects. You're definitely going to get something out of this episode. I picked up a few tips and tactics and tricks I'm super excited about and glad to know that I have those skills for my next trip in the backcountry. So, really hope you enjoy this episode. As always, you can catch the show notes at xomountaingear.com forward slash 27. Thank you for listening. Here's this week's episode. The Hunt Pack Country Podcast is proudly brought to you by Exo Mountain Gear, makers of ultralight, ultra tough packs that are designed to do what you love most hunt the backcountry. Exo packs are designed for efficiency, simplicity, and durability that's backed by a lifetime warranty. To learn more about Exo Mountain Gear, please visit www.exomountaingear.com. Well, Clay, uh, welcome to the Hunt Back Country Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing awesome. Appreciate the the invite. Yeah, we're uh, we're excited to talk to you. I think, you know, I had I didn't know it was you, but I had seen some of the backcountry uh, college videos uh, of which you make, and we'll talk about here soon. But then, you know, when we we're recording with uh, Lantani from Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, he kind of mentioned you in passing and mentioned the stuff that you do and some of the stuff even that you had taught him, and was pretty much saying you were like a backcountry wizard. So. We're excited to pick your brain on on some of the topics that you specialize in, for sure. Well, uh, I, I I don't know if I can live up to what uh, <laughs> what Lance built me up to be. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So I guess just to get us started, I mean, you you have a, a pretty interesting background, and you're doing some awesome things, uh, you know, in the industry with film and partnering with backcountry hunters and a ton of resources and content that you've developed on your own. Can you just kind of give us an overview, a history of um, how you got into hunting and and some of the things that you've done along those lines? Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I got into hunting probably a a little bit differently than most folks that, that are into hunting these days. You know, most people that are in hunting they're they hunt because, you know, they came from a hunting family or their dad hunted, uh, their brothers hunted, things like that. And I didn't have that. I mean, I came, I was very fortunate in the way that I grew up. I mean, I grew up on a ranch and had, you know, unlimited access to being outside and being around animals and wildlife. But, but I didn't really have that, that hunting or outdoor mentor like a lot of folks had. What I did have was, you know, just uh, for some reason, I got stuck with this gene that just drove me to be outside all the time. I, I wanted to be outside. I wanted to be, you know, building forts and fishing and, and being close to wildlife. And, um, you know, just through that love of um you know, I spent uh, spent a lot of time outside and just wanted to learn and uh, wanted to be close to wildlife. Um, and, and basically, that's how I got into to hunting. I mean, I always had a love for it, and I just I just went and did it, even though I didn't have anybody to, you know, kind of take me and, and show me the ropes. So I you know, ended up making, um, you know, made a lot of mistakes and, and just kind of learned along the way. Um, but it was all good fun doing it. Yeah. How old were you when you kind of went out there and started hunting on your own then? Well, I can remember when I was just a little kid. I mean, um, eight, nine, maybe I had a a BB gun and I'd chase the quail around in the brush or, you know, hunt rabbits around the house. So I was just a, just a, a young kid, but I, I didn't get into, um, 
I didn't get into big game hunting, like deer hunting, until I was probably 14 or 15. And one of my friends' dads uh, finally took me deer hunting. And I can remember, I mean, I, I loved it so much. I, I can remember the first day we were out uh, deer hunting, I mean, like it was yesterday. And we, we went out um, and spent all day in the woods. And we were, you know, down there, we were making deer drives. Um, and, and, and hunting with a big group of guys. And I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. So you continue to hunt a uh, big game to this day and then you've, you know, you've gotten deeper into it. And as you mentioned, just love to be outdoors. You started, uh, kind of filming some things. What, what, uh, projects do you have going on on that side of things that you can tell us about? Yeah. So, um, I'm, I'm working on a film right now. Um, so I, I started carrying a video camera, you know, a long time ago. I was probably, well, I was, I was hunting with a compound still back in high school. Um, when I, when I first started carrying a video camera and I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. I just, you know, enjoyed carrying a camera with me and, and filming stuff so that I could go back and show folks what I was seeing. Um, and then I started, really the way that that the twisted state media got started I, I started making bow building videos after i got into bow building um you know there's there's a lot of stuff a lot of good, really good tutorials online um that show people how to make bows and, and arrows and things like that but there was when you when you go through that process there's all these little small intricacies and nuances that that people kind of gloss over and oftentimes those things can make a big difference and, and so i saw kind of a need um to put out a really in-depth and comprehensive kind of a tutorial and so that's kind of how i got started in the educational uh type of videos and then it's just kind of kind of you know progress from there yeah that's awesome so we're gonna certainly get to the bow building and some of the traditional archery stuff but you know, going back to kind of how land introduced you to us. And then, you know, again, how I mentioned, I kind of knew about some of your work, but didn't actually know it was you. Um, on that same line of educational videos, you've done um, some backcountry college stuff with the backcountry hunters and anglers. Can you mm -hmm. explain what that series is and how that came to be? Yeah, so backcountry college, um, I, I guess land, uh, I got to talk in the land probably – I don't know, three, two and a half, three years ago. Um, and he was wanting to do something along the lines of, um, you know, some sort of how to or educational type video. And we, you know, we went back and forth and finally came up with this idea for backcountry college. And it, the, you know, it's supposed to be targeted towards like folks that are just kind of getting into it, you know, to maybe the, the novice level, but, um, one of the things I strive for, and I don't know if I always succeed, but I, I really try to put um, some little tidbit of advice or uh, something like that in there that, you know, even expert guys that, are, that have been out there for 20 years can learn from them. And I, you know, I think we've got two dozen or so videos right now, and it, the, they cover everything from, I mean, I think the first video was talking about how to pitch a like a fully enclosed tent from just a flat, you know, rectangular tarp uh, to knife sharpening and, and fires and navigation and, um, you know, uh, pretty much all sorts of, uh, you know, kind of woodcraft and woodsmanship type skills. Yeah, that's awesome. So let's dive into some of that. Um, you know, one of the topics that always stands out to me these days, there's, there's so many um, technologies for navigation, for example. I mean, you have... You know, you have your handheld GPS units. Um, you have those GPS units sort of supercharged, if you will, um, with all kinds of technologies like the guys from Onyx Maps and stuff, which is great, and I use it. You have smartphones. You have all these things in terms of navigation. But, um, you know, I think it's still so important that we actually know what we're doing fundamentally in terms of principles of navigation and moving beyond technology so that we're not reliant on it exclusively. So do you see more and more that there's guys who maybe don't know those principles and are just relying on devices and what's maybe the danger of that? I, I, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, 
I think there's it's becoming more and more prevalent for folks for guys to go out into the field with with nothing but their GPS. Um, and I, you know, ninety nine percent of the time that's that that's probably going to be all you need. But you know, me personally, I don't I don't want to be reliant solely on technology. Um, I mean, I have a GPS. I've got one of the little Oregon 650s, and I've got the, – the reason I bought it was because I could run that Onyx um, uh, mapping software on there because I do a lot of hunting around, you know, private lands for whitetails, and it's real handy to know where the, pro- where the uh, property lines are. But I don't, I don't use it for navigation, and the big reason that I don't re- – I don't even turn that thing on uh, when I'm out in the woods like elk hunting or something is because – and I don't know if everybody's like me, but um, have you guys ever like been a passenger in a car and, you know, had somebody else figuring out where you're going, going to somebody somewhere new and like had when you got there, you had no idea, like you couldn't drive back there if you had to. You ever right. been that? You ever, <laughs> I, I yeah. mean, and I'm I'm terrible about that. And I feel like um, and I've caught myself doing it before, like when I was using my GPS to navigate. It's like when you watch, you're watching that little arrow on there, and you're using that thing to tell you whether or not you need to, or whether you need to bear left or bear right. You know, if you're if you're letting that thing figure out where you need to go, and 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 something happens to it, if you're out in you know rolly terrain, uh, closed canyon be timber and if it's overcast or something like that and that thing does crap out on you you're going to pick your head up off that screen and have no freaking clue where you're at right. and so I, I think i think it's it's very very important to uh, you know just be aware of where you are and be aware of you know the context i think it's very easy to lose to lose that that context when you have your your nose in the screen all the time yeah so it's almost like a situ- situational awareness issue then Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, you can, I mean, hell, uh, uh, Lewis and Clark navigated all the way across the country in places that they've no white man had ever been before <laughs> and all with, uh, dead reckoning. Yeah. I mean, geez. So what are some of the, you know, this might sound obvious, but you know, just to get down to specifics, what are some of the, um, approaches that you do take when you're out and you're navigating your GPS is in the pack or what have you? I mean, are you just, keeping an eye on, you know, peaks or major terrain features and your position in, in terms of that? Are you looking at specific drainages? I mean, what, what are some of those things that are kind of going through your mind and that you're keeping an eye on just to, to keep your frame of reference? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think it depends on the kind of country that you're hunting. Um, I mean, I've been in, uh, like we just got back from a, a mule deer hunt in the, um, Frank church and it's, uh, you know, down along the rivers, it's all open country. It's, it's very distinctive terrain. And I mean, you, in a, in a situation like that, it's, it's easy. I mean, you just look around, you know, where you're at, you know, where you need to go, you know, but there, there, there's other situations where, you know, you might be, like up on some big, broad um, kind of plateau or rolling country and, and closed canopy. Um, and in a situation like that, it's real easy to get turned around. And so it's very important just to, to you know, keep just keep that that um, uh, keep yourself in that context so that you know where you at where you're at in relation to you know where the truck is or where major topographic features are um you know it's it's easy to stay oriented when you can look a long way you can see peaks and stuff like that but when you're in a situation like where you don't have those things um it can be really easy to 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 get turned around and so uh, just keeping you know being aware of where you are is is very important yeah so then in terms of, um, you know, getting down to really granular level for navigation, do you carry, you know, paper maps and a compass and things like that for sure? Or you pretty much rely on the GPS, you know, if you need it for something like that? Yeah, no, I, I've, I, I always carry a map just like a, a one to 24,000 scale kind of a quad map type of thing. Um, and, and I, 
you know, I carry that for more than just navigation. I just like having a big map because you can lay it out and you can really see how, you know, the terrain lays out, how different features come together. Um, you know, rather than just having a small screen on a GPS, it's, it's, I just like having that big area, but, you know, in conjunction with that, I'll, I also carry, a um, like a sighting compass that has a mirror on it. And so if I do need to, um, you know, I like to triangulate my location based on topographic features, just not because I really need to, but just because it helps me to kind of keep that skill, you know, polished up and ready to go if I need it. Yeah. I mean, it certainly is a skill when you get into some of the compass work. I think that's one of the things that keeps guys relying on technology is they start to look into a compass thinking, oh, this is easy. It just points north. And then they start to realize, oh, well, north might not be north because of magnetic north yeah. versus true north and, and all those issues. And I think it, you know, sometimes scares guys away. Is that something that you cover then yeah. in, in the navigational videos that you've done with the backcountry colleges, you know, how, how to set a compass and those topics? Yeah, so um, I, we did two uh, videos on backcountry navigation where we're talking about navigating with a map and compass. Uh, and I cover, like, how to set the declination, um, which is the difference between magnetic north and, and true north. Um, talk about triangulation, um, how to read a topo map. I think we get into that a little bit. Um, and it's uh, I, we cover some other stuff, but I can't remember exactly what what it is it's been a while since i made those videos yeah cool but it's i mean it's not uh you know navigating with a compass is a map and compass is not difficult uh it just takes a little bit i mean anybody could learn how to do it and you know if you read a you know an article on it and then took a map and a compass out in the field and just did a couple of exercises i mean some you'd have it down pat and no problem yeah hmm. i think that that's a great point one thing that you know I think gets a lot of people is, you know, we talk about the concept of, you know, all these different backcountry skills or woodsmanship type skills. They do sometimes take practice. I mean, it's not just something mm -hmm. you can read an article or even go watch, you know, one of your videos right now in February and then just remember everything in September. But like anything else, it's a skill. And so it needs to be developed and you know, it'd be a great excuse, uh, to hit, you know, the off season and go outdoors and kind of practice some of these things for sure. So, yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. Go ahead. Yeah. Just one of the other, uh, I want to just kind of two other topics, really. One of the ones that I'm always curious about is, uh, fire starting. And I think just because there are so many <clears> different <throat> methods all the way from, you know, a Bic lighter to flint and magnesium and all kinds of things. What What is your approach with fire starting in terms of what tools do you use? And then maybe what's your backup tool? Uh, well, I have a, I've got a Bic lighter in my pocket like every day. I mean, that's just one of the things that I'll grab my wallet and a lighter and stick in my pocket. Um, and I don't, you know, people ask me if I smoke and I'm like, well, no, I don't smoke. I might need to start a fire. Um, <laughs> but I, that, Probably, probably ninety-five percent of the fires I start is is with a lighter. I mean, they, they work, they and they work well, and they're pretty damn reliable. Um, but at the same time, you know, when I'm out in the woods, I'll have in my I've got a little emergency kit that I put together, and I've got a little waterproof um, uh, container in there with uh, with storm matches in there. And if you guys haven't uh, haven't played with those things, they're freaking awesome. Uh, you can dunk them down in the water and cover them up with dirt and pull them back out and shake them off and they light up again, like just automatically. They're pretty, they're pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but that, uh, that, and then I also have, uh, usually will carry a, like a, a ferro, ferrocerium rod, uh, in my pack as well. So I've got a couple of different, um, you know, fire starting methods. And then, uh, you know, as far as, uh, something to generate a spark or a flame and then, uh, oftentimes I'll have, um, uh, like a, a cotton balls with, uh, with petroleum jelly on it to keep that flame going. Yeah. Yeah. That's one thing I discovered too. I don't, you know, know where I got the tip, but those cotton balls with, uh, with the Vaseline or petroleum jelly is awesome or, yeah. you know, uh, it it, lint, anything like that. It's a phenomenal way to get things going. Yeah. The, um, one other thing that, uh, like, 
one of the things that I'll do with uh, with the cotton balls is take. I often have like just a small piece of um, tin foil with me, and I mean you can use tin foil for a thousand different things. But if you take a small piece of tin foil, maybe the size of a silver dollar or something like that, and kind of make a little dish out of it, <clears throat> then you stick that uh, cotton ball in there. So when you light that cotton ball on fire, a lot of that petroleum jelly is going to liquefy. It'll drip out the bottom of it. And if you don't have that tinfoil there, it kind of just drips out and it, it just is gone. And and so if you put that tinfoil under there, you can uh, in, you can significantly increase the uh, the burn time of those things. So if like up here in North Idaho in the wintertime, it's real humid and you're dealing oftentimes with, with fine fuels with a real high moisture content and you need a long burn time to get those things dried out. And, and so you can really get a, a good fire going. So that's a, um, one of the things that I'll use often uh, a lot of times. That's yeah. A great tip. Yeah. That's an awesome yeah. tip. We had to do that up in Alaska just to get fire started. It was put, just put a, like two foot by two foot square area of aluminum foil. Cause the ground was just pure muskeg, you know, like anything would just burn down into the ground. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome tip. That's cool. <laughs> so I, one of the ways that, you know, I've learned the hard way and then seen other people struggle with fire is, you know, they go and they think, oh, I need to get something going. So they grab, you know, their cotton ball or what have you, but they're not really ready to get a fire going, meaning they don't have the the other resources that they need to sort of, you know, complete the process once they have a spark or once they have things going. So what does prep look like for you in terms of, you know, getting ready to create a fire? Well, yeah, I mean, you make a great point. You need to have uh, everything from your real fine fuels on up to the stuff that you're going to put on there, you know, the, the logs that are the size of your forearm or so, something that's going to keep it going. Um, you know, there'd be nothing worse than to l- use your last match to get a fire going, and then you burn up all your fine fuels and, and don't have anything to else to put on that thing to keep it going. Um but as far as prep goes, I, you know, it just depends on what the conditions are. You know, um, like I say, and up here uh, in the wintertime, you're dealing with oftentimes your fine fuels have a real high moisture content. Um, and uh, so, you know, you, you might have to spend a lot of time really trying to find some of those um, those finer fuels uh, that are dry. And if you can't find any, you might have to spend a little bit of time making some and you know, one of the things that you can do uh, if everything's wet, say it's been you got a heavy wet snow or it's been raining for a week or something like that and everything is just soaking wet. Um, you know, there's a couple of places that you can look, you know, you can look obviously under a real dense like a dug fir or a grand fir or something like that. Um, and then you can also take uh, uh, one of those bigger logs. And if you have a knife on you, that's um, that's a, a fairly stout knife you can split those those bigger logs uh, and get to the wood on the inside and then just shave off, off um, you know, some of that finer uh, curlings and shavings like that. And, and that works really well as well. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask specifically about, uh, you know, tips or tactics for wet conditions, but I guess that's, <clears throat> that's pretty much it. You kind of have to look for dry fuels that might be undercover, or as you said, maybe go inside mm-hmm. of and get rid of the exterior uh, moist content to get where it's dry. Do you have any yeah. specific considerations when it's, uh, you know, windy or breezy or you're in a more open area in the mountains? Um, you know, just, just not really. I mean, find a, find a sheltered spot, uh, would be my only, um, my only real advice to somebody. Okay. Why you got something, some cool tip you want to share? <laughs> oh, I wish, man. I wish. Sometimes I've just, I've faced it where you're sort of caught out, you know, in a, in an open area. Um, I just didn't know if there's anything you can do, whether that's building some sort of yeah, I, wind block or what. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've used, like, I've used my pack and stuff to, to break the wind and, and just piled up stuff on the windward side. Um, you know, if you're, uh, if you're having trouble, like if you, if, if you have just a, a, a pack of matches or something like that and the wind keeps blowing your matches out, you know, you just get down there and, and I, I've, I've used, like I said, I've used my pack and then just use my body to kind of shelter that just until you can get that flame, um, you know, going just a little bit stronger. And then once you've got that going, um, you, you know, the wind's just going to help it pick up. Yeah. So one thing you mentioned earlier, definitely wanted to cover, um, you kind of hinted at like an emergency kit or survival kit. 
Um, what, what do you typically keep in there? Because I know that, you know, guys are all over the map. I, I have buddies even yeah. who are super minimal and bring pretty much nothing. Um, and then I have, you know, the buddies who are the just in case guy who's like, oh, I should have, you know, three flashlights and this and that and just kind of go overboard. So what do you typically carry? What do you consider essentials uh, for someone who's going to be spending, you know, multiple days in the backcountry? Yeah, so I, I'm somewhere in between those two extremes that you just talked about. Um, I carry just a small bag. It's probably six by six. Um, and, and inside that bag, I'll have like the probably the most important thing I have in that bag is a is another bag. It's a, a, a like a contractor uh, trash bag. It's, it's a drum liner is what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's taller, it's taller than like the regular contractor bags. You know, the, the regular ones are like, I don't know, 40 inches tall or something like that. But this one is like, it's, it's almost, it's probably 68 inches. So, I mean, I can put that thing over the top of me and stand up and it almost touches the ground. Um, you know, you can cut you a little face hole in it and uh, and put that thing over you and it'll keep you dry. Uh, you just want to make sure you're not breathing in it because um, you'll, you know, your your uh, breath is going to condensate in there and get everything wet and then, then you're going to be worse off. Um, but that, uh, th- you know, and I looked around online for those things, those real tall um, trash bags. And the only place I was able to find them was... Um, a website called uh, outdoorsafe.com and uh, uh, Peter Crumsfeld, I think was his name. He, uh, the, the way I found out about those bags, he did a, uh, um, he was doing a seminar down at the BHA rendezvous in Denver uh, there a couple of years ago. And I saw those like, man, I got to freaking have one of those, <laughs> but, but I've got, so, so that I've got that. And like I said, I've got my, um, my little waterproof case with my storm matches in it. Um, I carry a whistle and then I've got a little, um, a little small, like a tiny, tiny little, uh, led flashlight. And the things, the thing's not any bigger. It's about the size of a quarter, but it's super, super bright. Um, so it's like and I carry that with me and lights. you know, I, yeah, and it's um, it's a photon. Okay, is what it yeah. says on it. But um, I mean that thing, it's uh, it's super bright, and I'll go through that thing and change the battery every year just just to be safe. Um, and then I always carry a bunch of paracord with me, like the real high quality military grade paracord. So is that pretty much it? What do you, um, like in turn, you mentioned earlier splitting wood, you carry a pretty decent knife, which is something that I don't always do. Oh um, yeah. But what do you, what do you carry there? Uh, so I've, yeah, I've got a knife that's, um, like a, a kind of a drop point, probably got a four and a half, a five inch blade. And the one I've been carrying, uh, is made by Chris Reed. He's out of the UK, but it's got, you know, who makes it's not important, but what, what is important for me anyway, is just having something that's stout. I mean, uh, the blade on this knife is probably three sixteenths of an inch thick. So, I mean, I could use this thing as a pry bar if I wanted to. Um, but like for splitting wood, I mean, I can, I can take this thing and set it on top of a piece of wood and then smack it with another piece and just give it a little twist. And I can pop wood. That's, you know, like a lodgepole pine, I can split wood. That's, you know, three inches diameter with this little bitty knife. Um, so it's, yeah, I always have a, a good, like a sheath knife with me. Um, let's see. Oh, and then I, uh, one of the other things I carry with me is a, a titanium water bottle just to, you know, if, if for some reason I need to boil water or, um, you know, cook something like that, I've got that thing and it works out really well. Um, uh, but that's, that's, pretty much it I'm, I'm sure there's some stuff i'm missing but that's everything that i just pulled out of my little kit <laughs> yeah no that's good what do you use as your uh, primary water treatment method depends on where i'm at um we've got one of those base camp like uh, platypus units i'm not sure what what the model is called but it's one that you can just 
you know, you put like two gallons or a gallon and a half or something like that in it and just hang it up in a tree and then it just kind of filters yeah. throughout the day and, and fills mm -hmm. up a, a, a bag on the ground. Yeah. Uh, that mm -hmm. thing is awesome. Um, but like when I'm hunting, like the places we've been elk hunting, super high elevation. I mean, um, basically you're, it's glacial melt. And I, in situations like that, as long as there's nobody camping, and there's no cows around or anything like that. I'll just drink out of the stream, okay. and I don't have any problem with that. Um, you know, that's just a uh, something that everybody's got to, you know, make that decision on their own. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, there's probably, I, you know, I've know I've been in places where it probably would have been fine, and I know I've been in places where, like, even in Colorado, I've been at you know eleven thousand plus feet, and they have out of what seems like nowhere grazing rights. And it's like, holy cow, like you, you know, you come up and there's cattle at over 11,000 feet when you're least expecting it, you know? So, but I'm certainly, yeah. there's uh, it, places that I'm sure you can be safe with it. Yeah. The, um, I had, uh, I, I got sick there a couple of years ago, elk hunting, and I had one of those damn little, uh, little filter straws and I can't remember who made it, but I drank out of, a place that I never would have drank and drank from without that straw. And that, that thing gave me a false sense of security. And I drank from, it was basically just like a, a, you know, stagnant ditch with algae and stuff growing. It was disgusting, <laughs> <laughs> but, but nice. that's, I, you know, I, God, I drank through that straw and I got sick and I was like, man, you know what? Screw that. I'm not, <laughs> I, you know, if I had been, if I had been just following my own rules, you know, about what kind of stuff to drink from, you know, I wouldn't have got sick. So I said the hell with that. Yeah. yeah. That's probably a good, good lesson for all of us. I think, you know, there's so much that we think is miracle gear or products that are foolproof. And I think just sometimes we put too much trust in them. Certainly good to have and certainly thankful for them. But yeah common sense wins more than gear, you know? So, mm -hmm. so Absolutely. On, on that topic, let's take a shift, uh, kind of talking about gear and reliant on it and kind of getting back to the basics. You, you mentioned before making bows and you've also hinted it, you know, before you used to shoot compound bows. So you've made a big jump, uh, to the transitional side in a big way all the way to making your own bows, making your own arrows and, and getting really heavy into it. What, what led you to make that change? And when was that? Uh, well, um, I had, I've always had an interest in, in, in traditional archery. Um, you know, ever since I was just a small kid, when, when, the, when I first got into traditional archery, uh, when I was probably, I don't know, 10, 11, 12, something like that. My brother had found an old Ben Pearson recurve somewhere. I don't know where he came up with it, but he brought it home and I started shooting that thing and I shot that thing till it delaminated. Um, and, and I was, you know, that was, was during that time, that was one of the, the times when it was a real like heavy upswing in the rabbit population down there around our place. And so I spent that all fall, uh, and late summer chasing rabbits around. And, uh, I don't think I ever killed one, but I had a damn good time doing it. Um, <clears throat> but I, when I, when I started wanting to get into deer hunting, you know, as far as bow hunting goes, I didn't know anybody that shot traditional. And this was kind of, you know, before the, you know, Google and the internet really got rolling. So it wasn't like you could just go online and find a community of people that were there and ready to support you. And so when it got, when it came time to, you know, get a bow for deer hunting, I, I got a compound because that's what everybody else around me was doing. And that's the only thing that I really knew, you know, at that time, I, I, I didn't even know you could kill a deer with a recurve um, because I didn't know anybody that was doing it. Um, and I shot a compound for a couple of years and uh, probably around the time, maybe shortly after I graduated from high school, I, I started getting into to building my own bows and I, I tried to make bows before and never was successful at it. Um, but then I found a book, uh, called the traditional bowyer's Bible. Um, when I, about that time and I started making self bows, um, 
and started hunting with them. And I sold my compound and never looked back. Wow. So most of your big game, you know, hunting, at least as an adult, has been strictly traditional then? Yeah, I've been shooting a self bow, um, you know, a wooden self bow since I was probably 19 yeah. or so. So, you know, 15 plus years. Yeah, that's cool. So, Steve, you were you're on that uh, fence considering making the jump this year. Certainly not, you know, putting down a compound for good, but you're looking at potentially uh, getting in the elk woods with a trad bow this year. Yeah, yeah, I've been, it's been on my kind of wish list. I knew I'd get there someday, you know, kind of had that mentality of, well, once I get a few animals down, I'll, I'll make the switch over. And, and, uh, I think just this is the year I just want to, I got a bow on order a couple of weeks ago and, uh, like a 54 pound recurve and I can't wait to start shooting it. I know I got a lot to learn. So definitely would love to get some of your advice, Clay, on, on what you, um, you know, what's kind of your top tips for beginners. Oh, that's, that, that's awesome. And I think, um, I think you've done really well starting off with, with a bow of that weight. I think that's perfect to start off with. Um, I, one of the, probably one of the biggest, um, mistakes that I think new guys getting into traditional archery make is they overbow themselves. They, they get a bow that's, that they can physically draw and they can physically shoot. But, um, one of the things that you don't want is when you're first learning to shoot a traditional bow, you don't want to be struggling against, you know, tr- kind, trying to draw that thing and keep it at, 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 uh, at full draw. And, um, you know, even me, I've been, like I said, I've been shooting traditional for, for, you know, 15 plus years and I still will go back from time to time to a, a very lightweight bow, like 35, 40 pounds, just to work on my form and, and, and get my shooting really dialed in. Um, you know, when you're, when you're trying to figure out where your anchor is and figure out back tension and, you know, proper form, the last thing you want to be doing is, is struggling against your bow. Uh, mm, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So I, I'm mm-hmm. total, you know, novice to traditional. I've done nothing but play with them. Um, and it's, you know, even kind of been years since I've played with one regularly. But I was just kind of surprised to hear you mention back tension there. I was always in more of a snap shooting mindset. Can you kind of talk about the release with the traditional bow? Like just in terms of, um, you know, anything from what's going on muscularly to what's going through your head and, and kind of how you're releasing that arrow yeah so i mean there's there's a bunch of different ways of shooting traditional gear and some guys will um snap shoot um you know and 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 there's some guys that can do it very well and i'm not one of them um you know i for a lot of years um I tried to shoot purely instinctively where, you know, and you'll often hear it described as, you know, like it's like throwing a baseball, you know, you you don't aim a baseball, you just pick out your target and, and, and hurl that thing. And, and most of the time you can, you can get pretty close. Well, I'm, I, I, like I said, I tried to do that for a, a lot of years and was never, you know, I would go through spells where I could like, you know, I could um, put them in a three inch circle at 20 yards every time. And then I'd go pull those arrows and come back. And I it, like, I literally couldn't hit the, uh, the target. And I just never was satisfied with the level of consistency I was getting. And so I started experimenting with different ways of aiming and different methods of shooting and finally settled on a method of aiming. That's, it's kind of, uh, uh, it's kind of a modified gap shooting type of a thing. So when you draw a traditional bow, you obviously you don't have any sights. You don't have a peep sight. So it's important to come to that, that same draw or that um, the same draw length uh, and then your anchor every time. But then what I do is I, through my peripheral vision, I'll, I'll look at my arrow tip and kind of use that as a sight. And so I'm, I'm lining up my arrow tip left and right and then the elevation, um, if you look at that sight window um, or the sight picture, the whatever you want to hit, 
is above your arrow tip unless you're far back and then you're then you'll raise up until uh your arrow tips above whatever you're wanting to hit does that make sense <laughs> yeah sort of <laughs> um yeah it sounds kind it of complicated. would be it'd be it's it's not it's not that complicated it'd be a whole lot easier if i could draw uh draw you a picture mm-hmm. um but uh, anyway, I mean, if you read about it, you'd know what I was talking about, but just read about gap shooting. But the reason I say my method is kind of modified is when, when guys are pure gap shooting, um, they'll consciously like judge yardage and they'll say, OK, my arrow tip um, is, you know, whatever, three inches below the, the target or three feet below the target, whatever. Um, and they, they, they consciously measure that gap. And I don't do that. I kind of just um, the the elevation, like where my bow arm raises to, is kind of instinctive. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the the left and right lining up, that's that's more of an aiming type of thing for me. Okay. But I mean, well, if you talk to ten different guys, but but if you talk to ten different guys, you're probably going to get ten different ways of of aiming and shooting a traditional bow. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of it just comes down to you know you just can't get away from practice and learning what works for you and what doesn't. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So how about on arrows? I'm assuming you're probably building wooden arrows. Um, Mm -hmm. is arrow spine something that really comes into effect as far as, you know, having consistent shot or just having consistent, the spine be consistent throughout the arrows that are in your quiver. So they're all shooting the same. Yeah. Yeah. Spine is, is huge. Um, and so spine kind of tends to confuse people sometimes. Um, you know, when you order shafts, like I, I, I shoot wood shafts, um, and you'll order them in spine groups of five pounds. So, you know, uh, 50, 55, 55, 60 or, or whatever. Um, and it's, it's very important to have all your spines matched and it's very important to have your arrows matched to your bow. And one of the things that, that kind of tends to confuse folks is, you know, they think because they're shooting a 50 pound bow that they need arrows that are spined at 50 pounds. And, and that is not the case at all. Um, you know, arrows are, uh, when you shoot an an arrow, it's a dynamic process and there's different forces that are being exerted on that arrow. And for a longbow, which is not center shot, when, if you, uh, if you Google archer's paradox, you'll come up with some pretty cool videos that are showing the arrow actually bending around the riser of the bow. Um, and so when you shoot that arrow, basically what, because the bow is not center shot, your string is trying to shove that arrow through that riser, which causes the thing to bend and flex. Um, and so like for me, I shoot my bow that I'm shooting now is uh, probably about 55 pounds, and I'm shooting a, a 65 pound shaft. Um, and there's there's all sorts of other things that come into play. I mean, you can you can adjust the um, how much that arrow bends by your tip weight, um, even by you know the length of your feathers. Um, how long your total arrow is, so uh, you can really and uh, you know. How, how the arrow comes off the bow is, is called dynamic spine, basically. Mm-hmm. And uh, so you can really have a huge influence on where that arrow strikes based on all of those different factors, based on how stiff your arrow is, based on um, you know, your brace height and your arrow tip uh, weight um, and your, how, how the degree of center shot in your bow. So you can definitely... Mm-hmm tune a traditional bow and you do it with all of those different factors by playing around with those things. Wow. I I guess I, I mean, I, I, coming from compounds, I know how critical getting an aerospine perfect is. I didn't, I wasn't aware that it was that critical with, with traditional equipment. Yeah. And it's not, so, so if you're shooting a recurve that is, um, center shot, it's not, it's still important, but it's not as critical as with a long bow or even a self bow, which is even less center shot than a long bow. Um, okay. your, your spine, having, having the spine matched to that bow is, it becomes very important when you're at the farther away from center shot you, you get. Okay. Hmm. So tip- what, um, go ahead, Mark. Oh, I was just wondering what tips do you have? I mean, you mentioned the importance of the anchor point, 
And that's even as a compound shooter, I realize how important that is. And I can only imagine much more, as you even mentioned, without a peep and things like that, that the anchor has to be consistent. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, for those guys um, who are transitioning from a compound bow to a traditional bow, certainly the anchoring is much different. What tips do you have for them? I mean, is anchor point with a traditional bow really just a matter of comfort and consistency? Are there certain you know, things to look at anatomy wise, like your hand should be here or there. Um, what tips do you have? Well, it, where, fo- where guys anchor, um, is just, it, it depends on, you know, their, the structure, their body, the, the build, um, that they have. Um, I, one of the things that I think is important is to anchor on some, you know, hard, uh, part of your face. And I, for me, I bring my, uh, in the, the knuckle of my thumb in my drawing hand, I put that behind my jawbone, uh, you know, kind of in that little space, uh, under your ear and behind your jawbone. And so I know that every time I come to full draw that when I stick my knuckle in there, it's in the same place every time. And then, you know, I have kind of almost a second anchor point in my back. Um, and I, and so when I rotate my drawing shoulder around and bring my elbow back, you know, basically my shoulder blade is kind of, um, uh, rotating around until it can't rotate any, any farther. And that's, I use that almost as a second anchor. That's interesting. So (laughs) your, your shoulder becomes a draw stop, if you will. Right. Like, so you know, guys from the compounds are used to draw stops. I mean, that's kind of what you're doing essentially with your anatomy. Yeah, yeah, I guess kind of in a way. Yeah, that's pretty wild. Yeah, that is really cool. So you over more overwhelmed now, Steve? More excited? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, I got to go to when I was at the ATA show. Mark, you were there with me. I got uh, Elite came out with a new, just kind of modern recurve, and I, I had more fun shooting that thing. And I've had shooting a bow in a long time, and we just I just kept shooting arrow after arrow through it. So I can't wait to get the bow and just start practicing. And whether or not I am proficient enough to hunt this year, I just I'm really looking forward to the process of learning something new. And you know, traditional is just kind of that next step up of something that's that much harder, and you got to get that much closer to the animals. Yeah. So Clay, what's uh, shot distance? What's kind of your you know your ethical range? Well. Um, it just depends on the situation. I mean, I'm sure you guys are the same way. Um, uh, like this, this past, uh, September, I shot a bull at 35 yards and that is the farthest shot I've ever taken at a, at a big game animal. But you know, when, when that, when that bull stopped or stepped out, the distance never even crossed my mind. It wasn't, you know, I, but when I when I'm aiming at an animal, I'm not like consciously judging distance. I'm just kind of mm-hmm. like I said, my my bow hand just kind of comes up until things look right. Um, but er, I mean, I felt like when when I when the animal stepped out, there was no question in my mind that I could make that shot. Um, and uh, but there's other times when you know, ten yards is going to be too much. You know, so it just it, it absolutely uh, depends on the situation. Like. Um, you know, for whitetails, for instance, I and I grew up hunting whitetails, and those things are so their reaction speed is so fast. And you know, if I have a whitetail at even five yards and it's looking at me, I won't even shoot because it's going to be gone before my arrow gets there. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it it absolutely depends on the, the the situation. Gotcha. So pretty much under forty yards is probably would be a max under the best case situation for you. Yeah, even I mean, I, I don't even I wouldn't shoot at forty yards. I don't okay. think um, yeah. it just when that bull stepped out. It, you know, I'd been shooting all summer. I'd been I keep a bow by my back door, and every morning when I step out, I've got a target that's thirty yards from my back door, and I'll shoot three arrows to go to work. And then on the weekends, I come home and I'll shoot. I mean, I don't know, a hundred arrows a day at, at that target, mm-hmm. uh, if not more. Um, so I I had been shooting all season long, all summer long. And, you know, there was just, there was no question that I could make that shot. Cool. So what about arrow weight and forward of center and all that stuff? I'm sure you've done a lot of testing and experimenting with, with different uh, configurations. What's kind of, what have you settled on? 
so the the arrow that I'm shooting now, um, I ha- I shoot a 200 grain broadhead, a cedar shaft, tapered cedar shaft to get it even more weight forward. Um, and I can't remember, you know, what my percentage is on weight forward, um, mm-hmm. but it's it's probably it's a lot more than what most guys are shooting as far as you know in the compound world mm-hmm. um but i like a, a heavy head and that's one of the reasons that i had to go with with a, such a heavy spined arrow is because to, to keep that dynamic spine up you know if you're shooting a heavy head you're just you're going to have to have a um a heavier spine but i i like those I, I shoot a single bevel um you know three to one ratio broadhead and and really like those things hmm. well, so what's your total arrow weight my the arrows that I'm shooting now are probably uh, six forty, maybe something like that. Total okay. weight. Okay. When you mentioned the three to one ratio, there you're talking about the angle of the blades. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. So they're uh, you know three times as long as they are wide. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty. I've never. Um, I've never heard of that specifically looking at that ratio. I mean, it makes sense. You know, I've obviously looked at angles, but I guess just that concept of ratio is new. Is that kind of standard in the traditional world to measure or rate broadheads by ratio like that? Um, I think it's becoming more prevalent. Um, are you guys familiar with uh, Dr. Ashby, Ed Ashby's work at all? Yeah. Nope. Yep. Okay. Well, that, I mean, that's where all that stuff comes from. I mean, he, they, they shot thousands of animals over there in Africa and, and, and looked at all that stuff through a, you know, kind of a scientific microscope and, and figured out all these different components and all these different, uh, um, uh, uh, way to build an arrow to make it penetrate better. And, you know, if you, of course, if you make a good shot and you put it right where it needs to every single time, anything. I mean, you can kill a deer with a 30 pound bow. The, the, where this stuff comes into play is those times when things don't go right. You know, maybe that animal takes a step and you clip a shoulder blade or something like that. And when that happens, you know, if you have all of these, if you've taken all these steps to ensure that you're getting the best penetration possible, you know, maybe that's going to make the difference. And so that's kind of why I tend to focus more on that type of stuff. Yeah. yeah, you have to plan for the worst case scenario for sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So back in way up, Clay. Again, I'm a total novice to this, and I love soaking it up because you know I know I'll get there one day as well. But just to to go to the beginning, what what are the main differences um, between a recurve and a longbow in terms of shooting experience? And for guys who are interested in jumping into traditional archery but don't know much. Um, is there one that you would point them to over the other in terms of a bow for hunting? Um, well, um, I'd say probably 10, 15 years ago, there was a big difference between recurves and longbows. Um, you know, longbows tend to be straight limbed. Um, at least they did back then. And now most of the longbows being made are pretty heavily, um, they have kind of reflexed limbs and there's, as far as I'm concerned, there's not a big difference in the way they shoot. Now I'm sure there's going to be guys out there that are probably, you know, um, rolling their eyes at me right now. And, and there's a lot of guys that could probably speak more, uh, in depth about that than I can, because I've, I've only ever shot self bows. I mean, I've shot long bows and recurves, glass bows, um, but I'm not, you know, hugely uh, schooled in that type of stuff. But, um, you know, most of the guys that you talk about, talk to that have shot both, you know, for the modern designs anyway, both recurves and long bows is uh, the general consensus that I've heard is there's really not a whole lot of difference uh, between the two. Um, but you, you know, most of the guys that you're going to be seeing that, that are moving from compound to traditional, they're going to pick up a a recurve first. And I'm not sure why that is, um, but that they're they're definitely a whole lot more prevalent. I I guess I was under the impression a recurve was just faster than a traditional, uh, than a longbow. Uh, You know, with the longbows they're making these days with the heavily reflexed, uh, limbs, I mean, they, those suckers can can streak an arrow downrange, um, okay. and 
I, I don't, I really don't think, I don't think there's a whole lot of difference. Now um, you'll, you'll hear guys saying that long bows are more um, stable um, and there may be something that, something to that but i think that mostly has to do with like if you were to get a recurve that was like a real short bow or even a long bow that's uh that's a shorter long bow they're they're going to be a lot less stable and a lot less easy to master than a uh, than a bow with longer limbs okay what did you go with steve i'm curious did you when you ordered your bow did you i mean i know obviously in terms of your ideal draw length and draw weight and things like that. But were there any other considerations in terms of the overall length and things like that? that yeah. You looked at? So I ordered my bow from South Cox of stalker stick bows. Uh, and we just did a quick, you know, I just kind of like, I know nothing about this. So what do you suggest? And um, so it's, I'm a 29 and a half inch draw length, set it up for about 54 pounds at that length. And then I believe he said 62 inch limbs, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then just they're just recurved limbs. It is a riser where you can swap out two longbow limbs if you want to at some time. Um, okay. But mm-hmm. as far as the specs, that that's all I know. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So Clay, I that's, know that you that, you know that's good. They yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I was just gonna say they make a good bow, so I think that'll do you. Uh, that'll do you well. Awesome. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm really excited. Looking forward to it. So, Clay, I was just going to say that you have, uh, you know, you kind of mentioned you got into um, doing videos because of some of the materials you put together for um, traditional archery and building self bows and all that. So, where can uh, guys find those and what specifically topics have you sort of covered with the videos that you have out there? So they can find it on either my YouTube channel or the website. It's uh, twistedstave.com. Um, and I've like for the archery stuff, I started with, with bow making, like how to build a long bow from a piece of wood, which is, you know, most guys aren't going to take it that far. Um, but I've got other videos on there about, you know, how to build arrows. I've got stuff on there about making strings and how to serve strings. Um, and I'm, I'm currently working on a, a series on tuning, um, which, which gets into all that stuff we were talking about, you know, spine and dynamic spine and, and tip weight and brace height and all that stuff. And I'm, I'm actually, I've got one of those uh, newer GoPros that'll shoot like 240, 240 frames per second. And I'm showing how those different when you when you modify things on your bow, say your brace height or your arrow tip or something like that. I'm showing in slow motion what the effect of that is on your arrow as it's flying downrange. So that, it's it's current. It's uh, I think it's going to be pretty cool, but it's going to be a little while before I get it out. That's awesome, though. Yeah, so, I'll definitely be watching. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I know that you've done some hunting videos. Um, can they find those on YouTube as well, or um, in terms of your hunting videos, uh, where can they find those? Yeah, they, uh, find that on my website too, or on YouTube. Um, uh, the first film that I did is called Untamed, uh, and it uh, was on uh, the hunting film tour until just this last August and I uploaded it on, uh, up, up to the YouTube. Um, and it's got, I've heard from, I don't know, thousands of people, uh, about that video that everybody's really digging it. Yeah. It's very um, cool. And I'm currently working on, well, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I'm currently working on another one. Uh, the title of it, the, this one is going to be called Ascent. Uh, and it's actually going to debut at the, the BHA rendezvous here in uh, first week in April in Missoula. You guys plan on being there? I'm I'm trying to. I might trek up there with some Boise guys and check it out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Besides that, is there a plan for how you're going to release the film? I mean, after that event. Uh, it'll go on tour again. I'm not sure where it's going to be, uh, but it'll follow the same type of uh, track as as. Un- tame did i mean it'll go on tour and then once the tour is over um i'll upload it to to youtube so everybody can see it yeah awesome well steve is there anything else you wanted to cover on the trad side uh i think that covers it i said i got a lot to go into i might be emailing you a few questions clay (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah i mean i I get uh i get emails from guys all the time i I get a, a lot of emails from guys that are 
in your shoes. I mean, they're, um, uh, you know, they're compound shooters and they're thinking about switching and they, and they want advice. So I, I try to help everybody as much as I can. Um, but there's, there's also some, um, some places online and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to help everybody, uh, that I can help, but there's a couple of places online that you can go as well to, uh, to get into some of those communities, um, that have, you know, guys that have been into it for, you know, uh, 50 years. I mean, there's just a wealth of knowledge. Um, one of the places you might check out is, uh, the professional bow hunter society, um, and they've got a forum on there where you can go and post a question. And I mean, like I said, these guys have been in tra- traditional archery for you know their whole lives, and they are just a, a wealth of information. Mm, okay, that's cool. Well, Clay, we awesome. we really appreciate your time. I know we covered a lot of topics and jumped around, but you know, I I picked up something everywhere. I mean, even the little tips like the you know putting the foil under your. Uh, cotton balls and Vaseline like that's you know I always just love learning little stuff like that that you know can make you more prepared and more effective in the field for sure so we appreciate you sharing your info with us and uh, might have to have you back on here again another time um, talking more about trad and some things like that yeah, I appreciate it. I uh, I hope I didn't confuse uh, everybody about how the, the aiming method, but it's it's really not that difficult. <laughs> well, we just we'll just have to practice it and we'll figure it out, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Cool. Well, thanks, Clay. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Well, that's a wrap. Be sure to send us your questions or feedback to podcast at exomountaingear dot com. Consider leaving us a review on iTunes if you're enjoying the show. Or, as always, you can check out the show notes at forward slash 27. Thank you for listening.